thanks for all of you coming out tonight. And I'd like to introduce to you the president of the NAACP. Uh, the NAACP is sponsoring this um, debate, actually forum. And just so you know, the program is being taped for rebroadcast on Sunday evening, 8 p.m. on Service Electric Channel 2. Participants in the debate, please use the designated microphones at the table so the viewers at home can hear the questions and answers. As I indicated, this is part of the NAACP programming that we are proud to present to the community. And it is my great honor as the first vice president of the NAACP to be serving with a longtime leader in this community and a person who has been the NAACP president for quite a while, Mr. Ron Felton. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm happy to see all of the candidates here running for the various offices uh, to participate in this uh, Meet the Candidates Forum. Uh, the NAACP, since its very founding, has thought that power lies in the hands of those who take part in the political activity of his country and that's why we always encourage uh, voter registration and political activism and that is why we try to bring these meet the candidate forums to the local community so that our constituents the people that we represent will, would know when they go to cast that ballot they would have some idea as to who it is they're voting for and uh, we have done this for many years, and we hope to continue doing You'll probably see a lot more of this in 2020. Uh, but I just want to thank all of the uh, candidates who are here tonight. I want to thank all of you in the audience that are here tonight to help, uh, help us present this forum and to hear what the candidates have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, again, we appreciate the fact that you're here. And uh, what we are going to do is, there are two lovely people by the name of Flora and Sabrina, uh, Cabrina, who have some index cards. And what we would like to do is, if you have a question for any of the candidates, please write them on the card, make it legible, so that we would be able to um, read the um, questions so that we can get the answers from them. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of a roadmap tonight um, on basically how we're going to do this. We have candidates in competitive races up on the stage, candidates for the Wilkesbury City Council in District B and C, as well as school board candidates. And we're going to be ask, asking the candidates three questions, and then they're going to be giving us hopefully three answers. And then we'll have the school board uh, candidates uh, be asked three questions and get the answers from them. Uh, please be respectful of the venue, the candidates, and your neighbors. We don't really want to have a lot of uh, conversation because that doesn't make good TV, like cross-conversation cross in the audience. Uh, one reminder, though, before we start, uh, the NAACP is going to be having its annual uh, Freedom Fund Banquet, and that's going to be October the 25th at Wilkes-Barre Giannetti's uh, restaurant. Uh, the speaker is going to be Brandon J. Flood, and he was um, a prisoner nine years ago, but basically is the new secretary of the Pennsylvania Pardon Board. Uh, we're going to have music by, um, by uh, Mood, Mood Swing, and it's going to be a great event, so if anybody wants any more information on that, see Ron or myself after the meeting. So let's get started and see what we're going to be doing with, this, um, uh, with, these, uh, with these questions. We're going to be starting out with the first council candidates. And um, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to ask each candidate, though, to stand up and tell us a little bit about themselves. And they'll, they'll have like a three to five minute limit. So we're going to start with the council candidates first. And then we're going to be asking the questions. And then it will give you an opportunity to hand your cards in and ask the questions of the candidates too. So, we're gonna begin with uh, Mr. Bill Barrett, who's an incumbent councilman in the city of Wilkes-Barre, and that's District B, and his district comprises of Miners Mills, 
Parsons, and uh, let's see, parts of East End, correct? A little bit, and a little bit more. A little bit more. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Barrett. Hi, everyone. It's a little awkward sitting here, if you don't mind, I will, though, that for the purpose of the microphone, but my name is Bill Barrett, and as Mr. Yonkai said, I am running for re-election in District D in the city of Wilkes-Barre. A little bit about myself, I am a lifelong resident of the city of Wilkes-Barre, born here actually in North Wilkes-Barre. Uh, other than the military, I've lived here pretty much all of my life. Uh, and I live in the Parsons section of Wilkes-Barre. Uh, I went to Coughlin High School many years ago, and on to King's College, and on to the Pennsylvania State Police Academy, and following that, the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. I spent some time there as well. I am um, a veteran of the United States Army, Vietnam era, and I am also a veteran of the Wilkes-Barre Police Department. I spent 28 years with the Wilkes-Barre Police Department. Started many years ago and uh, held every rank within the department other than, the t other than a detective. And I retired as the chief in the year 2000. So I had spent quite a few years with the police department and moved on to a position with the Pennsylvania Inspector General's office. And subsequent to that, I um, obtained a position with Luzerne County Community College as their director of safety and security. And up until this year, I worked there full time and I'm kind of I'm trying to retire, but it's not going well. So I find myself there one or two days a week, you know, just trying to keep things going the way they were going. So when I first ran for council, I ran in a citywide uh, operation or whatever word you want to use, citywide mode, where there were seven of us running citywide. And that was an experience running uh, across the city as compared to the way it is now. And the following election, we went into districts and we reduced the number of council members to five. And there's five of us that are elected by district. And this is the way I like to say it. We're elected by district, but we represent each and every one of you. And I know all of our council members feel the same way. I really don't care if the problem is on Lehigh Street or there's an issue on Scott Street or wherever it may be. Although we're elected by the people within our district, we, all of us on council, the five of us, represent all of you yeah. equally. Uh, so it, your problems, your concerns, your suggestions and recommendations are all of ours as well. So it's a little bit different. Uh, district D, uh, just to continue on that, I don't know who drew these up. I'm not quite sure, but they're a little bit different. Uh, it's the upper end of Miners Mills, half of Parsons, all of East End, and a little bit of the Heights, right down to the Heights Elementary School, kind of like a stripe on a flag across, across the top of the city. Uh, so it may, it's kind of spread out a little bit, and each neighborhood is a little bit different. But again, they're all in the city of Wilkes-Barre, and all the residents uh, within the district are, uh, of course, equally important to me, as well as all of you throughout the city. So that's a little bit about me, where I came from. Uh, I. Uh, as far as council, and I know the question comes up a lot about, I've heard it recently about salaries and benefits. Right after the first term of council, we froze council salaries uh, right where they were. That was 100 years ago. Well, not quite that long, but quite a few years ago. And we just kept it that way ever since. I don't take any of the council-related benefits, the health care, the pension fund. I don't contribute or pay in any of that or don't participate in any of it. I'm very fortunate to represent all of you. And um, again, I just want to thank the, uh, the committee that put this e evening's event together. I think these are so very important. You don't often get a chance to meet all of us, especially in this type of setting. And we don't get a chance to meet all of you in this type of setting. So again, thank you very much and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Barrett. All right, now we are going to be going, and we're going in alphabetical order in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> so now we're going to go in, now we're going to go with uh, uh, Councilman uh, Tony Brooks, and he uh, represents District B. That's part of the Iron Triangle, uh, part of uh, Rolling Mill, well, Rolling Mill Hill, Iron Triangle, and part of downtown Wilkesbury, the Ross Street, Wilkesbury, uh, Wilkes College area. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Brooks. Thank you, David. <clears throat> First, also, thank you to the NAACP for hosting this event. Um, before I start, though, I think we should pause to remember Carlton 
uh, Barrett who died, uh, Garrett who died, Gwen Garrett's uh, brother. Uh, I think many of us do know Gwen and uh, pass on the sympathies to the family. And also, of course, this morning we lost Elijah Cummings and we lost a giant in the house. And in the morning's um, interviews, they asked what motivated him. And he said pain, passion, uh, and purpose. And I think everyone in this room knows what that's all about. We've all had some pain. And of course, when you have passion, you really find your purpose. So I think we should thank both of those gentlemen. Um, a little bit about me, I call myself a boomerang. A boomerang is someone who was born and raised here and went away for years. And usually you have a different perspective on Wilkes-Barre when you return. I returned in 2003 to discern for the ordained ministry at St. Stephen's Church. And while I was here, I had to get a job and I worked for Leadership Wilkes-Barre. And that experience, uh, Leadership Wilkes-Barre made me love Wilkes-Barre even more. And I decided, you know, I'm just gonna stay here, buy a house, create a family, and I did. Uh, from Leadership Wilkes-Barre, one of the board members, president of a local bank, Luzerne Bank, hired me uh, to market their centennial campaign. They were the last local bank in town. And I did that, and then from there, jumped to the Historical Society for six years, and now I'm the director of the Preservation Society. A lot of people get them confused. We're the group that is, as you might have seen in the newspapers, restoring the oldest house in Wilkes-Barre, um, the Zebulon Butler House. But I took some notes about a lot of things that I want to do, but I want to first say what I think are the three most important things about local city government. And I think, and they're not really in any particular order because they're all so important, but I put on the top of the list economic development, job creation, community development. Number two, delivery of the city services. And number three, what I call aesthetical planning. How our city looks, how it functions, and the infrastructure. And if we go through all those things, first, economic development. Because we're a third class city, Harrisburg laws really bind us on how we could raise revenues. And the two, three biggest ways that we raise revenues is obviously property taxes, which I brought the city budget. If anyone wants some good reading, you can read through the budget. It is online. It's $11, $11, $11 million. Our earned income tax is $15 million. And the fees that we pay for services, um, such as uh, golf fees at the Hollenbeck Golf Club, that comes in at $10 million. But I want to focus on earned income tax. The key to more revenue in Wilkes-Barre is the earned income tax, and that comes from jobs. So for example, a $25,000 job is 750 bucks to Wilkes-Barre. $50,000, $1,500. The president of Wilkes University made $400,000. That's $12,000 um, to Wilkes-Barre. That is the way we can grow, is by more economic development. The mayor is the chief economic development officer. But I really think the mayor also needs what I would call a full-time job for economic development, because that is so key and so important to analyze all of our land and all the buildings and how are the ways that we can attract more companies to, to, to town, because economic development is the way to avoid property tax. Another example of economic development in my mind is historic preservation. Historic preservation is economic development, and the greatest example of that would be the FM Kirby Center. That was totally restored in 1986, and look at what it has done. And the gentleman who ran um, the Kirby Center, Will Beekman, who's now running the arena, said to me, if I had another venue in town, I could double what the FM Kirby Center has done. He would turn away business, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so behind the restoration of the Iron Temple project, because that can give us another venue in town and we can stop turning away certain kind of acts. Um, I think we should come up with programs to incentive private land development. And um, Bill and I have actually talked about this. If you look at Pine Ridge in Parsons, there's a lot of empty land there. There's also 240 empty parcels in Wilkes-Barre. A program to incentivize new development on those lands. Maybe we waive some kind of fees, do a tax abatement for one or two years, get the building up, then it's on the property rolls uh, in, in a couple of years. And I think that's a good program. Um, 
Our, our universities could do a be much better job, not in the pilots, they have another program that I think that we need, I don't, probably, you probably don't even know about this program, but if you work for Wilkins, you can get $10,000 on a down payment for housing. Wilkes-Barre. Not here. That is tremendous and should be used even more um, and expanded to other companies like Bard and Highmark and Geisinger. What does that do? If that incentivizes you to live in the city, that will stabilize the neighborhood. That will reduce crime. That will reduce your commuting uh, time, which will also make your life a lot, a lot easier. But the most important thing is it creates jobs and we would have a raise in the earned income tax. Am I over time, David? Um, another 15 <laughs> seconds. Oh, okay. Um, I believe that city workers should live in the city. I think the, the current mayor made a mistake. And if all city workers would come back into the city, we would increase a quarter of a million dollars in our earned income tax. Um, I also think that we should really have an initiative to make sure everyone is counted in this 2020 census. There is a thought within the uh, department of uh, DPW that we're not 43,000, that we're way more than that. He thinks, uh, the head of DPW thinks we're 50,000. And if that's true, and we can count it and prove it, that leads to more money from grants and federal money. I'll end it there so you can go. Thank you, Tony, really appreciate it. All right, the candidate, the Democratic candidate running in District B is Mr. Mark Schaefer, and you're gonna hear from him today. Thank you. Uh, I'd again like to thank, as everyone else has, the NAACP for organizing this event and this great historic church for hosting us. Um, again, my name is Mark Schaefer. I'm running for Wilkes-Barre City Council District B, and I'm the Democratic nominee. Uh, I, to give you a little bit about myself, I graduated from Dickinson College in 2016 with a double major in economics and political science. I work at the CareerLink as a data analyst where I track performance data for our programs designed to help people get jobs and find training. These programs give me an understanding of the local economic scene. It gives me data on where people are getting jobs, what the growth occupations are, and what jobs are in decline and what jobs people are leaving. To give you a little bit of an idea of why I'm running for city council, my parents are in the audience tonight, so I'll use them shamelessly. Um, my father is a veteran and my mother is a nurse, and the two of them taught me the importance of public service and commitment to your community from a very young age. My father, through his service in the military, taught me the importance of committing to something larger than yourself. And my mo mother, through her nursing, taught me the importance of serving people through your daily work. Um, I am focused mainly on three core issue areas in the city. My three core areas are infrastructure, the housing, and the opioid epidemic. I think that we can focus specifically on these issues and get our economic development. The way you develop an economy is not give things away to developers who do not need the money. The way you improve an economy is to make investments in your infrastructure to attract the investment. If people aren't investing, if we have undeveloped plots, it's because the infrastructure isn't there for them. It's not because they need money. These developers have the money, they just need the infrastructure around them. Um, I'm focused for our infrastructure on developing a five-year plan for the city for our grant funding. The model for this is Pittston, who recently has completely revitalized their downtown through utilizing LSA grants, which are the money that we're supposed to get from the casino. The way the city's been doing it as it is, is sort of we apply for grants when other people ask us to. When Kings comes asking for money, we apply for a grant on their half. When the movie theater comes asking for free money, even though they're in a tax-free zone and the guy who owns it is a multimillionaire, which was voted on and passed by our city council. Um, he got hundreds of thousands of dollars to install new chairs. Uh, instead of doing that, we should be using that grant money to develop a five-year plan to improve our roads, fix our bridges, clean our streets. When the Luzerne uh, Tourism Board looked, paid for a study, the biggest problem we had was curb appeal. This is fixed through this kind of investment. The other most important issue for me is housing. 
when I go door to door, everyone in the neighborhood has some abandoned house in their neighborhood, some landlord who doesn't take care of their property. Uh, to address this, we need to start up the Luzerne County Land Bank, get it really going. In Lackawanna County, they have a land bank, and it has cleared 100 properties in two years. If you talk about abandoned properties and abandoned homes, that's real progress. These, the way the land bank works is instead of doing it the way we do it now, where once someone goes into, goes back on their taxes and it goes up for a tax sale, right now, some random person, someone who doesn't live in the city, someone who owns a bunch of properties in the city already, can buy a property for next to nothing. They do the basic amount of investment to get it up to code, get someone in there, and because the city doesn't do regular inspections as they're supposed to, they let the housing completely fall apart and keep getting people in there. So they get the rent, but the housing declines and it's poor housing for the people who live there. So instead of that with a land bank, instead of going straight to the tax sale where some bad landlord can buy it on the cheap, the land bank will fix up the property themselves they will have a policy where they give preferential treatment to owner-occupied homes or local landlords and tax-generating businesses. The most important issue for me personally is the opioid crisis. Uh, this issue is why I'm running. Uh, a year and three months ago, my cousin died of an opioid overdose. Growing up, my cousin was my greatest role model. Um, I switched the sports I played and the positions I played in sports to be more like him. Um, I remember a lot of arguments with my mother. Uh, I played the cross, and when you're playing, technically you don't have to wear elbow pads. And my mom used to always tell me, you have to wear these. And I said, no, I'm not doing it because Joe doesn't do it. Um, he was a star athlete, uh, loved by everyone. But uh, for years, he struggled with anxiety and depression. and. He used drugs to cover his mental health issues. And I think when we talk about drugs, we need to keep this in mind. When you talk about addicts, this is who you're talking about. You're not talking about some scary person. You're talking about our family members, our neighbors, and our friends. Is the common stories are either what my cousin went through or someone who gets an injury at work, gets hooked on pain pills, runs out of money, and ends up on street drugs. These are people who need our help. For years, Luzerne in particular, Wilkes-Barre in particular, and the city and the country as a whole has treated drug addiction as a criminal problem to be addressed through, if we throw them in jail, it'll go away. That's not how we need to treat it. We need to distribute more naloxone to keep people alive. We need to pair with new organizations that are coming into the area to provide treatment opportunities like New Roots. Um, and we need to make sure that we embrace these innovative solutions. And um, now that I've depressed you all with my uh, great stories, um, I, the reason I'm running is because I still believe in Wilkes-Barre. I chose to make my home here because Wilkes-Barre has a lot of strong fundamentals that I think we can build on if we make them proper investments in our communities. All these problems are serious, but I think we need to look at what Wilkes-Barre has gone through in the past. How many floods, how many mining disasters, a lot of these wiped out a lot of other communities, but Wilkes-Barre has always come back. Thank if you, we Mr. make Schaefer. investments, we can get our community back. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer, really appreciate that. And thank you for sharing your story. All right, now we're gonna have the Wilkes-Barre Area School Board candidates introduce themselves and introduce them to you, all right? And we're gonna start with Mr. Um, Atherton. And again, alphabetic order, folks. Good evening. And I too would like to thank the NAACP for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Mark Atherton. I uh, am a lifelong resident of Wilkes-Barre. I'm a graduate of Myers High School, along with my wife, graduate from Myers. I have two beautiful children. I've been married for 25 years. Uh, we got married when we were 12 years old, um, to, make that, to make that work. And uh, I have two beautiful children. And uh, I too believe in Wilkes-Barre. You know, I, I see, uh, I try to see the positive in everything, and, and when a lot of people are knocking Wilkes-Barre, I try to find the positive. And, you know, I think what Mark just said, it's, it's so true, you know, um, giving service to your community is very, is very special, and it's certainly a privilege. And uh, when it came time to 
I had, I had a lot of answers for a lot of problems. But when you get on the other side and you have to serve, and there's a lot more to it with a budget and everything else, you realize at times, as many people you talk to, you realize sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And when you get on the other side and you're in with a bunch of people and you're listening to budget constraints and you're listening to a lot of different opinions, ideas, and all good, but also understanding there's a lot more to it. And I think that holds so true. And I've learned that in the last eight months as I was appointed to the board to serve. And I think it is very important that if you give service to the board, you give everything you have. And I've learned that through uh, my teaching. I'm a teacher and some people look at and say, well, I don't know if that's a good thing. Why well, look at the opposite? I think it's a very positive. It's, you have your pulse on a lot of things, whether it's in your district or another district, you can bring a lot of ideas to your district. And I think that's important. I've coached all the way going back to Myers High School. When I was in college, I coached junior high girls softball. And I also coached the basketball team at Myers for four years as an assistant basketball coach when I came out of college. And I coached at Crestwood for the past 25 years, Crestwood School District. And that has taught me one of the most important things and, and is so fulfilling is how do you blend the personalities of all these different players? and to be successful? And how do you blend the personalities of a classroom to make it a success? And how do you blend the personalities of a school board for a successful outcome? And it's a challenge, but when it happens, it's very rewarding. And that's something that, you know, I try every day to blend the different personalities that we have. And different personalities is what makes it work. Uh, I think opportunity is the key to public education. And another reason I got involved is I think opportunity is a key and I want to provide as many opportunities while being fiscally responsible to our students. And we have so much to be thankful for and I know we focus a lot on test scores and I could combat that with growth and we could go back and forth, but we have a lot of good stuff happening in our school district. We have a, the Bell Choir at Kistler currently down in Harrisburg performing at, the, at Hershey. There's so many good things and that's currently happening today, happened today. We have so many good things, and we just want to, again, provide as much opportunity as possible. Uh, one, of the, one of the coolest things I did was after college, play, I played basketball in Misericordia, as I traveled with the, with the Washington Generals against the Harlem Globetrotters. And I went around to a lot of different places and a lot of different venues, and you go to Mexico City, and you see some of the poverty and then you go all of a sudden you hit an area where it's beautiful and you're performing in an arena and you're playing and you're looking around and it opens your eyes around the area and then you come back to Wilkesbury and you appreciate so much that we have and you see the potential but we see that we also have lost some of that potential we see people moving out and the answer with us with council with our mayor how do you keep people here? How do you get people back? And how do you get people excited again? Thank you, Mr. Atherton. Really Thank you. appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Jody Bush, who's running as a write-in candidate um, for the Wilkes-Barre Area School Board. I'm an old guy. I've got to stand up. I hope you don't mind. Anybody else have to stand up like a seventh inning stretch? I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Um, I am going to, first of all, I'm going to apologize to all of you. To elect me, you're going to have to write in Jody Bush, spelled like the beer, not the president. Although we have 15 variations on my spelling of my name, because my real name is Joseph P. Bush Jr. Well, with that said, I was born and raised here also in Wilkesbury. I um, attended Dana Street Elementary, then I went to GAR, played basketball, and also played baseball. Then I went to King's College for a year. I played on the freshman team, and then the new coach didn't want anybody local. So, Mr. Atherton, senior, took me under his wings. What a great guy. Then I uh, went to play some music. I've always been a musician. And that really is a big connection for me. But the other thing is, I taught for 35 years special education. I was very fortunate to work with those children, and they work with me. That's one of the reasons that I really want to get back 
into this whole situation. I'm currently a business manager at Advanced Hearing Solutions in South Wilkesbury. My better half said, you're not laying in bed. Well, I gotta get up and work. So that's what I do in the mornings. In the meantime, I've been pursued by the SOS group. If you've heard of them, Save Our Schools. They asked me heavily, would you please enter into this? And I said, you know what? I can't. I had a minor problem, a health problem, but that got solved, so I missed the primary. And again, that's why I need you to write Jody Bush in if you're really interested. Um, how much time do I have, sir? Uh, 30 more seconds. Okay. <laughs> Quick statement. Uh, SOS, we have a couple other members here. The first time I saw a black child was fifth grade. I'm up in Dana Street. They closed Mount Zion. To this day, I'm still friends with those kids. It was a great experience for me. And my parents were like, what are they doing? Because they came from the segregation time. That never rubbed off on me. I get the whole point of sharing this whole world with each other in love and happiness. Thank you, Mr. Bush, really appreciate it. All right, so our next um, presenter here for the uh, Wilkes-Barre Area School District is Beth Ann Owens Harris. And you are part of Save Our Schools, correct? Um, I'm endorsed by Save Our Schools. I'm You're not endorsed. technically okay. a member, but well, I'm you Save can Our Schools. That. Correct. Great, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Beth Ann Owens Harris. I am a lifelong member uh, or um, lifelong resident of Wilkes-Barre. I apologize in advance. I'm a little unprepared for this format, I feel. I wasn't sure exactly how this is going to go. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Well, I hope you like this. <laughs> um, so, lifelong resident of Wilkes-Barre. I'm a mother um, of three children. My school-age children are all um, in Wilkes-Barre area schools. They attend Wilkes-Barre area schools. I am a graduate of Myers High School. I uh, went to Kistler Elementary School. Currently, I am uh, the district psychologist at Carbondale Area School District. Um, previously, I was um, working as a psychologist in the Wilkes-Barre Area School District. I have um, a master's in child psychology. I have an education specialist degree um, in school psychology. Uh, I've devoted my entire life to education, and that's really why I am uh, here and running. Uh, along with devoting my entire life to education, I feel that I've devoted my entire life to this city. I'm passionate about this city. I believe in this city and where we're going. I feel like my knowledge and background in education, along with my uh, expertise in mental health, will allow me to bring something to the table for our schools that um, we may have been missing. Some of the some of the areas that I'm very passionate about, um, trauma-informed schools, making sure that our students are always put first no matter what. While working um, for the Wilkes-Barre Area School District, I spent a lot of time um, on community outreach, and that's uh, something I'm very pra passionate about. I believe that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that our schools are an open and safe place for our community, to, for everyone to feel welcome. Um, you know, we shouldn't, parents shouldn't only be getting negative phone calls home from the principal when the phone rings and they get that feeling of anxiety. We need to start bridging the gaps. We need to start um, reaching out to stakeholders and inviting everyone to be a part of the process. I feel like a lot of you know the city council members. What I'm hearing you know tonight from you, um, a lot of our problems are the same. You know, schools are a microcosm of the of the city, um, a microcosm of the world, and so the the opiate crisis and you know the infra infrastructure even, um, all of that negatively impacts you know a child's world world view, and the school board and being part of the school board and me you know being passionate about education in this city. Um, I just feel that I, I have a lot to bring to the table in that respect. Um, I sit on the Lackawanna County um, Safe Schools Coalition, the panel for Safe Schools Coalition, so I'm also very passionate about safety in our schools. Um, I spent four years as a graduate research assistant. Um, I've done four years of climate studies in the Wilkes-Barre Area School, looking at diversity, issues of belonging. Um, I am passionate about you know, revamping hiring processes to make sure that you know, the best candidates are getting the jobs and that, the, you know, that that is done in an anonymous way um, to ensure that that happens. Thank uh, you, Ms. Harris. <laughs> thank you for Please having me. It. Thank you, appreciate it. 
Now our next candidate is Reverend Sean Walker. Terry, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> our next there. candidate is Terry Felix. Sorry about that. Well, we, I did say we were going in alphabetical order, right? <laughs> the Slovak nuns are going to be very mad at me. Go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Terry Shewitz, and I would like to thank the sponsors, and I would like to thank all the residents who came out tonight to, to listen uh, to what the candidates have to say. I'm running for uh, school director for the Wilkes-Barre area, and I am a lifelong resident of Wilkes-Barre. I'm a Myers graduate, my husband is a Coughlin graduate. We are fortunate enough to have three adult boys who are all products of public school education and have all gone on to do incredible things. I believe in Wilkes-Barre, and I believe that the future of Wilkes-Barre is our neighborhoods. And for that reason, I believe that the most important thing that we need to do is find a way to get all of the parents, all of the children, and all of, the, all of the residents of this area together to have an impact on what happens in our city. For that reason, I have decided to run for school director. I, um, this is, bug is killing me. <laughs> um, uh, I, as, as a graduate of, of uh, Myers High School in 72, graduate of uh, Mercy Hospital School of Nursing in um, 75, um, a 1980 graduate of uh, the Wilkes-Barre uh, School of Anesthesia at Wilkes-Barre General Hospital. I spent 38 years doing clinical anesthesia as well as didactic anesthesia. I know what it's like to, to be a student and I know what it's like to teach. And so I feel that I have things to bring to the education of the students in our area. I truly believe in neighborhood schools. I believe that neighborhood schools are the way to keep our families cohesive. And I must say that I am not a fan of what I think is an imprudent decision to consolidate the school and put it on an area that I believe is questionable. Um, I'm going to get off of that subject and just talk about a couple other things that I would bring to the school board. I would have the school board meetings always accessible to people, uh, parents, teachers especially, belong at the school board meetings. Um, I think the school board meetings should be translated for our people who are um, language challenged, I think that that would make a huge difference. I believe that hiring in the school district should not be from the school board. It should be from professionals with anonymous candidates who are vetted and then chosen by the directors of the board. I believe that um, the area has a lot of positive things that need to, to change. Uh, I believe that the school board itself should have uh, a, a situation where if they are not sure of how to handle a, proper, a problem, that a committee should be formed from professionals within the area to give advice to the school board, kind of like an ad hoc committee. Thank you, Ms. Hewitt. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Terry Shewitz. Now, now we have Reverend Sean Walker. <laughs> Last but not least. Thank you very much, Thank you. Oh, am I on? Can you hear me? All right. So thank you, Mr. Yonkai, and thank you to the NAACP for uh, sponsoring and putting on this forum, and thank you to Mount Zion Baptist Church uh, for hosting it. Certainly appreciate also all of you, the residents of our great city, who have come out to hear uh, from these candidates to make the best 
uh, possible informed decision that you can regarding these very important issues. And so it's my privilege and honor to be here with you tonight. Uh, my name is Sean Walker. I also am a lifelong resident of Wilkes-Barre, born and raised in South Wilkes-Barre. Um, I am a product of Myers High School, graduate in 1994, and also a graduate of King's College, uh, where I majored in English with a concentration in writing. And I have spent uh, my professional career in various forms of sales, from entry level sales to large account management to corporate sales, district sales management, and business development is the most recent. Um, alongside of that, I've been privileged to be in a ministry where I have a uh, pastored churches here in this city, uh, and now I'm pastoring in Scranton, and uh, very, very proud of the work that I was able to be a part of or facilitate, uh, because we did serve the community, uh, especially the homeless and impoverished part of our community, uh, feeding them uh, twice a week, as well as uh, putting on clothing drives, etc. cetera. Uh, spent 20 years coaching the youth of our community uh, in basketball and have developed some wonderful relationships with a lot of children. And uh, I've been serving on this school board now for almost six years. I am running for re-election and uh, very proud to uh, have been able to make some serious progress uh, around the various committees that I've served on, including building maintenance, uh, budget and finance uh, as well. Uh, but more importantly, uh, this I would like to talk to you about public education and its importance. Uh, we must continue to protect it and defend it and provide it. And I am looking forward to providing, continuing to help this district provide a very quality education uh, to the most important people that we have in this community, and that is our children. And so people ask me all the time, why are you running? And I usually answer it with some kind of joke. Uh, but it's really not funny because our future depends on it. And my answer to that question is the work is worth it. I believe that our teachers are worth it, our faculty and our staff that work hard every day, they're worth it. And I believe our children are worth it and that they deserve more and they deserve better. And if elected, we will continue the progress that we have made thus far to make sure that they get better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Wack. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna ask a couple of questions to the council of candidates and Flora and Cabrina, if you have any questions from the audience, you could bring them up. But uh, I'm gonna ask, um, a question to uh, both Councilman Brooks and Mr. Schaefer uh, to lead off here. You know, you're not only battling one another for the council seat in District B, but your supporters are very vocal and sometimes very combative. What is it with you guys? I mean, you know, why are your, <laughs> why are your people so passionate about your candidacies? Mr. Brooks, we'll start with you. I think they love us, Mark, that's why, <laughs> right? Um, I think it's a, gosh, a badge of honor for both of Mark and I to have such passionate supporters and everyone on this table would want to have passionate supporters. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of my friends who, uh, that are supporting me. Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that we, I hope that we can put whatever unpleasantness behind us we seem to have, I think, um, and hopefully just move forward, have a debate where the two, just the two of us can talk and get into the issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is from the audience for Mr. Barrett. How do you feel the city should use local share account grants? That's, that's always been questionable about uh, how that process works and what, what we should allow to filter through council. For those that aren't familiar with how the process works, tax-free entities can apply for local share grants, which is basically revenue coming from the casinos, and it's awarded by the state. It's not coming out of the account or out of the city budget or any place else that uh, like that. And entities such as the Osterhout Library or any other similar venue could apply for funding. 
the Kirby Theater on Public Square, those types of places that might need to add an ADA accessible elevator or something like that that they don't have the resources to do, might apply for some LSA grant funding. Uh, I understand where some people may say it should be just the city and something that benefits the city directly, but that's not true because what benefits the Osterhout Library, what benefits the Kirby Theater, what benefits King's College benefits each and every one of us. There's only so much money in this grant funding that is being awarded. We don't make the decision, by the way. We just let it pass through city council with our approval. And the decision is made in Harrisburg. But all these projects, and, and we have denied several of them over the years. And there's some that we felt weren't beneficial to the city as a whole. So of course we'd like to pave every street in the city, apply for an LSA grant to pave every street throughout Wilkes-Barre, that's not going to happen. When they make the selection in Harrisburg, they decide what is best and what benefits the largest number of people. And, and we know that if we don't allow these to pass through, then that money, that LSA grant money, is going to go to Erie or Altoona or someplace else. So we are a little bit maybe generous in allowing them to go through if we feel that it's a worthwhile project that is going to benefit the city as a whole. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Now, uh, Councilman Brooks and uh, Mr. Schaefer, you did uh, touch on this in both your presentations, so I'm only going to give you 30 seconds to answer this. And what would you do about the uh, bladed properties in the city and uh, also um, and, and the garbage that sometimes develops around Wilkes-Barre City? Sure. So, um, so actually, here, Mark and I actually agree on, on land banks. I think Wilkes-Barre should definitely have a land bank. Um, when it comes to the blighter properties that we see in our neighborhood, a lot of it comes down to code enforcement and being aggressive enough with code enforcement. Also, there's these programs that we have in Harrisburg. The most recent program was to match dollars if you fix up your house. Um, I think that the match, it was a 50% match, was too high because what we were starting to hear was, well, we had to keep expending the deadline of this program because people weren't filling out the forms because you'd get $3,000 if you gave 3000 A lot of the people can't even afford that. So I would push for maybe a one to 10 thing, something, just a little bit of money um, so we can make those programs more accessible to more people. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, I mean, land banking is the number one thing. That's how you cut it out at the roots. Um, right. you, we can't do these sort of piecemeal fixes where maybe we Maybe we tear down a house every couple of years and that'll fix it. Um, we need systemic solutions like the land bank. Um, as Tony said, we need more code enforcement officers. Honestly, it doesn't make sense to me sometimes why we don't have more. They're a revenue generating position. But I mean, we also have to address the fact that Wilkes-Barre's got a lot of cronyism. There's a lot of favoritism. I've talked to people on the doors who say, my neighbor is, an, is a landlord who never takes care of their property. I called code enforcement about it, and they told me, oh, that's Joe, I know him, I'll talk to him, and then nothing ever happened. So we also need basic ethic rules in Wilkes-Barre that we simply don't have. Okay, and then the second part you. was gar garbage, what to do about garbage? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, one of the solutions that I think we should do with garbage is the health department should follow around the garbage trucks. And then that way they can also I immediately give out these quality of life ordinances. Quality of life ordinances is a, is a new thing that we introduced. There was a constituent of mine came to council and talked about Scranton's quality of life ordinance. She gave us a ticket system that they use. And you've, if you might see it now, we're implemented that ticket where you instantly will get a ticket for various infections. But if the health department who takes care of the trash violations would follow the trucks, the trash uh, on the schedule that they do, they can write out tickets, they can see the problems right away, and they can report them and make a database of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, anything on garbage or? Yeah, uh, on garbage, um, my concern on the quality of life ordinances is that a lot of the people who have the garbage on their properties, it's because they're poor individuals and we've done things recently like increase our garbage bag fees. I think we need to get rid of the garbage bag system, go to a sticker system like other st cities use. And I think we need to increase the number of trash cans in the city that are for public use. I've heard the complaint that 
if you put them out, then people will just put their personal garbage there. But you can easily, if you've been to any city, you've seen trash cans with have the cover on top, so you can only put small items in them. If you don't have trash cans anywhere, we wish people would take it home with them and throw it out, but they're just going to drop it. So we need more trash cans in the city. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to jump around. We're going to go to a question for the school district. All right. And again, uh, given our time constraints, we're going to ask for like 30 second answers. Um, how would you create more opportunities for students, especially um, people who are more into the arts and college bound? And uh, we'll start with Mr. Atherton. Again, 30 seconds, if you don't mind. Uh, we, we, currently, we currently have the CAPA program that's been created, um, the Creative Arts, uh, that's at GAR. So that is one program. People really don't realize all the opportunities that we actually do provide. Um, a couple of things, the STEM Academy. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's on. The STEM Academy, um, that's, that's certainly, uh, you know, very, very popular in the district. Um, we have partnered with CEO, we have partnered with United Way to provide opportunities. I mean, we have given a lot of opportunities, but for the arts, the CAPA program is a very successful program that we are getting students from all over and very excited about. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bush. Sorry, Mike. Uh, again, uh, what has transpired with the uh, current school board uh, decisions, uh, in my opinion, and the SOS uh, group, is that op opportunities for those kids have been reduced. Busing, those routines have reduced the availability of walking to. Uh, to the arts, to after school programs. Uh, Beth Ann uh, Owens Harris has tremendous programs that she will implement uh, to the best of her effect if we are unfortunately stuck with the new high school. And if we can have some things reversed, uh, we have other programs. Again, we're going to see more kids involved. Right now, you have one basketball team, one football team one cheerleading team, and I know the, the facts were uh, there's less kids participating. I understand that, but now there's really less kids participating. Thank you. On to another topic for the school board. Uh, currently, there are no high school fully ADA compliant. So for those who are opposed to the consolidation plan, how would you include students with disabilities, those with IEPs and uh, 504 plans, within the existing populations and structure. And that would be for the Save Our Schools people. How would you include, um, in if you're opposing the consolidation, would you include students with disabilities with the IEP and the 504 plan with the existing populations and structures in the way that they're set up right now? I'm not quite sure I can answer that in an appropriate manner, but, uh, we have always taken care of children who have disabilities in, in the Wilkes-Barre Area School District. And um, irregardless of the consolidation, I believe that that is a very important thing that the, the school board has addressed with its plans. Um, I would like to say one little thing about the previous question, if, if I may, and that is that um, I've talked to many people who have told me that their children have to drop out of one or two activities because they're not able to make it to practices, they're not able to, um, to participate in, say, a sport and a, um, a chess club or, or whatever. And I do think that that is an unfortunate situation where already we have people who have children who are disappointed because they have to choose between one activity or another. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see. How, we're gonna go to a question uh, for Mark Schaefer and Tony Brooks. And again, a uh, 15 second answer if you could give us an answer to this question. How would you fund the, the land bank? How would you fund that? How do you see that being funded? Um, you can get, get government money for the land banks, so from federal government. From the federal government? And, and look and see with Senator Dicek from the state government. 
Okay, so it would be seeing the right? Yeah, that's for the original startup funding and for continued funding it it sells the properties, so eventually it's self revenue, self funding. Okay, for the school district candidates, uh, you know, the tax base in Wilkesbury is shrinking. How would you, as a school director, balance that uh, that shrinkage of the tax base with the spending that you're going to be doing uh, with the uh, school board budget? Mm -hmm. Who's that to? Oh, that, well, let's see, that could be with uh, Mr. Watt. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're looking at me, so I'm going to count on you. Go ahead. All right. And uh, if you don't mind, Beth actually has an answer to that question, too. So I will take both. That would be awesome. Right, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so taxes are... are something that's on everyone's mind uh, and I've had the pleasure of serving as the chairperson of the uh, budget and finance committee over the last couple of years and uh, just so that we're clear um, we have done and are continuing to do uh, everything that we can to mitigate our tax increases uh, we had the choice this year to raise our taxes to the index or not and we were able to shave a couple of points off. And we went back and forth debating whether or not that we, uh, we should do that because we were going to lose over a several year time span, I believe it was some, somewhere around $10 million as a district in order to save the average homeowner about $100. Uh, but we thought it important enough to forego the $10 million so that our constituents and our taxpayers would save that $100. And so we are constantly trying to mitigate your tax increases. Um, I have said in the past that our taxes are going up year after year after year, and it has nothing to do with a, with a new school, um, but that there are so many other things, such as salaries, pensions, health care, uh, uh, charter school payments, transportation, and then finally debt service. Our debt service or our mortgage payment on our property continues to be one of the lowest in the state and it will continue to be one of the lowest in the state after the new school is built. The, our debt service represent, I, I believe, about $8 million, uh, which is about 4% or so of our entire budget. So we, there's other issues that we are working, that we need to work towards uh, in order to fix the tax problem. And we believe that the consolidation project will do that as that is a cost savings measure over time. Thank you, Beth. Sure, so um, with money in a district, there are very limited areas where you can actually get revenue. So taxes are one. Um, one of the biggest areas where we're seeing loss of revenue is in special education. And in my um, position, I was very fortunate that one of the major reasons that I left Wilkes-Barre um, to go to my new district was I was recruited to be part of a project that was specifically designed to revamp the special education um, departments in order to keep our kids in our buildings and provide their appropriate services in our buildings instead of paying large payments payments to for-profit organizations um, for children that have severe um, disabilities that currently we're not able to um, address. So with that plan, um, I've been able to see firsthand the success that we not only are our students now back with us, benefits everyone to have your students in your community. These kids, you know, are our kids. These are our community members. It doesn't benefit us to send them out, to send them anywhere. We can do it. We can do it cheaper. We can do it better. They deserve to be here. Um, and I've firsthand seen um, the money savings that is associated with that. So that is something I am very passionate about and would love to bring um, to the district. And um, it's feasible. I'm currently consulting with other districts in Lackawanna and Luzerne County to do the same thing with those districts. So other districts right now are on board and realizing the, um, not only the cost savings, because I hate to say that, because these kids deserve to be in our schools. They're in your YMCA's, they're in your McDonald's. It does, you know, it benefits everyone to make sure they're getting the best education possible and getting the services they deserve um, in their home school. So that is how I would save money. Thank you, appreciate the Part of the tax base problem in Wilkes-Barre is a double-edged sword. It is that we have colleges who do not pay taxes. 
We have um, a lot of nonprofit entities that do not pay taxes. And I believe that we should come up with um, a committee or a study where the people who are not paying into the tax base at this point, if they acquire new properties, they should be able to uh, donate a certain part of their uh, nonprofit status to the tax base of the city. I think that's the only way we're going to find uh, enough money to, to keep our tax base stable as, a, as something that is different than has been done in the past. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, this is for the uh, school board, um, basically. And then Mr. Atkinson, I'm gonna give this question to you since you have longevity on the school board, along with Mr. Walker. Uh, what are the diversity issues that have come to your attention? And how do you, how do you propose the school district address them? And do they address them? Well, um, let me just start off by saying Sean has about five more years on the school board than I do. I'm about eight months in, but if you want me to. Okay. <laughs> but that's okay. But you know what? You have 25 years of education. That's right. So that's right. So we'll go there. Let me, let me just, can I just revert back one thing I want to add also sure. to our credit? In the, in a, when I came, came on the school board and I met with you know, our, our board members and our, and our solicitor and our, our superintendent to get up to speed, they, they enlightened me to tell me that in the year 2015-16, in an assessment, it said by the year last year, we would have been in $36 million in debt. And by 2020, I believe, 21, that could rise over 60 million in debt if we keep what we currently are doing. They made tough decisions. Nothing to do with me, I can't take any credit for it, nor does anybody probably want to take credit. Unfortunately, the tough decisions were things that you hate to do as a school board. But they consolidated jobs, they cut some jobs, and unfortunately had to cut some programs to get us back on some sort of civility as far as financial responsibility. And they did that. And now we currently have a fund balance, you know, in the plus. And it's very important that we keep that road to that pathway to success, as we say. So I just want to add that part in there. Now, the question you just asked me, can you re restate it since I'm getting older and forgot what it was now? Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. What programs would? Yeah, what are the issues? How would, you divert, how would you address issues of diversity that come before the school board? And how do you address them? Is there like a structure? that you address diversity issues uh, on the school board? Well, I think diversity, I mean, one In thing. The educational system in Wilkesburg. Right, so we probably have a population, you know, we have a diverse population. And, you know, the diversity, obviously about 18% African Americans, I think it's somewhere in the 30s uh, of Hispanic population and others. And I think it's very important that we have programs that we try to even get people to and we try to implement a program, from what I understand, because when I was first on, we asked this question, and they talked about a program for teach, try to get kids involved in, and excited about teaching. And unfortunately, they tried to get a club started, and they couldn't get the club, they couldn't get enough mem members to, to join this club. And so they did make an effort to try in that regard. There's always more you can do, certainly with diversity, and try to get more diversity. And as far as recruiting teachers, you know, we certainly want to see a more diverse, you know, population of teachers. But we also know when you put out applications and you receive them back, they don't have to put down, you know, um, their race. They don't have to, to give that information. And most of them, from what I understand, do not. So it's not always easy, you know, to have diversity, whether it's for the students or more, more diversity with your teachers. I think currently we probably have about somewhere, about a dozen maybe, employees, you know, African American employees. So you want to have that diversity certainly throughout. Can I add something to that? Sure, go ahead. Okay, sorry. 
Um, uh, Ms. Harris. Sorry, this, um, this is a topic that I'm um, very passionate about, and I um, am a long-term member of the Northeast uh, Pennsylvania Diversity Education Consortium. I worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Office of Civil Rights while working in Wilkes-Barre to um, try to work on a few projects to add to the district. Um, one thing that I think um, is definitely in need and something that I would implement um, if afforded the opportunity, um, a, a discipline matrix to ensure that our student, our minority students are not over-disciplined compared to other students. That's something through my, um, uh, thank you, um, through my climate studies that I did while in Wilkes-Barre was a problem that came up over and over again. And so specifically addressing that and putting that procedure in place is crucial um, to our future development and the climate of any school that we're you know, going to build or have in the future. Um, I also think that it, you know, the recruitment process for getting, you know, our students need to go through their educational career and see someone that looks like them. It's crucial and we need to do more to make sure that that happens. Um, and, you know, training for our current, you know, staff to make sure that they're up to date on the issues that we're, you know, always in compliance with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, it's something that we can never um, stop thinking about. It always needs to be at the forefront. And I would be committed to that um, if elected. For sure. And uh, I think that you've touched upon this other question about how to create a more racially diversified staff. And Reverend Walker, if you want to add something to that, that would be fine, and then we could take care of this question. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, so I remember when I was a senior in high school, we took a field trip to New York City, and uh, a friend of mine uh, and I kind of left the group. We went wandering off on our own, uh, and we, we ended up somewhere around Wall Street. I remember seeing signs. And um, I was at an intersection, and we began to walk across the intersection, and I saw uh, African-American men in uh, suits. And that was something that I was only used to seeing on Sunday mornings. And so it was uh, a model, if you will, something that I saw that I didn't really see at home. And so uh, I think that modeling is extremely important, meaning we need to put professionals in the classroom and we have and do try to do that every time that we have an applicant, we uh, strive to uh, put that minority person in a classroom to see so that our kids could see that uh, person and see that model. The other thing that I believe is really, really important, and Ron Felton and I have talked about this over the years, is listen, uh, we do have a recruiting problem and we've made efforts to recruit, to try to get African American teachers to come and live here and work here. Uh, for whatever reason or another, it hasn't seemed to work out. But we have about 48 or so percent minority black or brown kids in our district currently. So what, what better opportunity do we have than to uh, tap into our own talent pool, uh, our, our, our minority kids that are existing and going in, are going through our public education system right here to encourage them and show them how the teaching profession can make a difference and an impact. And uh, so if we have 48% minority children today, that means we have 40%, 48% talent pool tomorrow uh, in order to uh, have teachers and other professionals in our district. And so my idea is, is yes, recruit, but that's proven to be difficult. So to tap into uh, our own uh, talent pool of very, very, very uh, uh, gifted children uh, and uh, give them the opportunity to be professional teachers and educators one day. Thank you. Uh, this uh, question is for uh, Ms. Hewitt and Mr. Bush. Uh, the school is being built right now, and it's you know being under construction. The infrastructure is pretty much set. Uh, how, if both of you are elected, what would your role be in terms of representing, say, our schools when the school is actually being built? Mr. Bush, what would your role be if elected? Well, the kids come first. That's the bottom line. Uh, our, our hopes were that it wasn't going to happen, but as you had said, it looks like it can happen. So if it happens, then we will totally support 
uh, the, the children. We will support the educators. But the message from SOS has been, even if this does happen, we would like all of those who did not listen to our voices, we would like them to not be on the board to have the celebration victory. We would like you to manage, be the majority. That is why I am here today. I've been asked by maybe thousands of people over the last few weeks, emails, texts, hand to hand. That is the reason that we would like to at least be elected, us four. You cannot and will not ever convince me that consolidation was a good idea for the Wilkes-Barre Area School District. There are studies that show that consolidation increases the dropout rate, increases the uh, disenfranchisement of the students who need the most attention. It makes our neighborhoods questionable. You can't, you can't bus everyone in the world without creating certain problems as far as, as the, the area that they're all being bused to and from, which from what I understand still has not been addressed how you are going to get all the kids from Myers and all the kids from Coughlin and all the kids from GAR to get on buses and get to that school safely. Um, that's, uh, like I said, I, I do not believe that it is a, a prudent site for many reasons. And although it is being built, there are ways that those contracts can be turned around and used to restore our historic schools that we have right now. And I know that sounds like a pipe dream, but it's what I believe, and it's what I will stand for. Um, Reverend Walker, you'd like to respond? Yeah, just a couple things. Um, first, just going back to the, the art situation. So our, our elementary schools still have music and art, as we always have, and seventh and eighth grade does as well, which is, uh, 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 which, which they always have, and seventh and eighth grade does as well, and then after eighth grade it becomes an elective, and we've created the CAP program uh, for those kids to participate, and instead of getting their one or two hours of music or art or drama or theater per week, they get three to four hours a day. Uh, my nephew has just recently become a part of that program and uh, enjoys it thoroughly, and not only that, it has turned some of his other uh, uh, academic concerns around uh, because he's so focused on staying in that program. Um, and just around transportation, because I hear a lot about this, you know, we have, we have no idea how we're going to transport. We do. We actually do know how we're going to transport. The plan is in place. Uh, we're going to need about, I, I believe the numbers were nine or ten extra buses, and that cost is going to be about a half a million dollars. Um, and and that's, the re that's the real number. Uh, so I wanted to share, share that with you as well. In terms of opportunity, there's going to be more academic opportunity for these kids in this new school. I've had the pleasure to stand on that site and within the building. I, can, I st stood in the Kappa section and I've stood in the STEM section. I've stood where the new chem labs are going to be because right now most of them are not functional. So uh, we are going to provide the adequate opportunity uh, for these kids academically and um, um, uh, I, I just wanted to clarify uh, uh, some, some of those statements to make sure that they were accurate. Mr. I just want to add one thing also. Our athletic directors uh, told us that there would be potentially over a dozen sports that would be dropped by schools. Now, could they be picked up and go to another school to participate? Yes, but when you say there's no opportunities, like, like we were told today, we're, all these kids are losing all these opportunities. Well, how about in the three sports where all these different sports were failing to get numbers and they had to go participate with another school within the district to try to even participate, even if that school had the number? I mean, that, that, that is a reality. You could, we could argue and say, we're taking opportunities away from kids, but I could combat that and say, opportunities were going to be lost, were already being lost, and in a couple of years, 
That's coming from our athletic director saying there's over a dozen sports potentially could be lost because of a lack of participation. Yeah, we had, we had seven, nine kids on our freshman teams between, or, or uh, yeah, I think seven or so kids at Myers and maybe six or seven or eight or so at GER. Within two years, our football coaches were saying that our football program was gonna be uh, obsolete. So they're just, my, my, when I came home from that vote that night uh, to consolidate the schools, it was, it was a, a difficult night. My son is an athlete uh, and student at Myers High School, and he and I had been debating that decision for weeks and weeks. We were traveling back and forth to Allentown for uh, basketball AAU practice that spring. And uh, he was telling me uh, that I better not vote to consolidate the athletic programs, if that's not what he wanted, um, uh, uh, because basketball didn't need it. And so when I got home that night, he asked me how I voted, and I told him, and he was very upset and uh, he began to cry. And uh, I, said, I said, son, here's what I want to ask you. I said, your favorite sport is basketball. And, and, and what if basketball didn't have the numbers? And what if your sport was about to become obsolete, but there was a group of people that had the, uh, the, the authority to save your sport? Uh, would you not want them to do that? Because uh, that's what I tried to do for those other kids. And I, uh, you know, we, we cried it out and hugged it out. Uh, but at the same time, he got an understanding. He said, I get it and I understand. And also back to, uh, you know, we always, we're, we live in a world of everybody or nobody. I hear that all the time. Everybody is for this and nobody wants that when that's just not true. It's not everybody or nobody. There are some people for something and some people against something. I have sat down with children of our district over the past week and a half who have come to me and said, hey coach, hey Mr. Walker, is there any way that this school can be finished next year? <laughs> Absolutely not, I tell them. Why? Because I don't want to go there for just one year. I like to go there for as long as I possibly could. I was at parent-teacher conferences today, meeting with teachers. Guess what? They're ready too. They want better. They want not only to provide a better education, they want to do it in a better educational environment. Thank you, Reverend Walker, we appreciate it. Mr. Bush and Ms. Shewitz have uh, some things they want to say. And Just, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap this up. I'm a political nerd since I've been eight years old and I could do this all night. But, every, <laughs> but I think everybody wants to go home. So let's just uh, go with the Mr. Bush and then uh, Ms. Shewitz and then uh, there's gonna be a lightning round for the city council candidates, okay? So <laughs> let's do this. Go ahead, Mr. Bush. I hate to stay on. Uh, the, the bottom line again is if we would have waited one more year when 60 people eloquently spoke at GAR saying, give us more time. In the meantime, Coughlin was being torn down, torn to the uh, apart. Uh, we couldn't get one more year. That's why the taxpayers are mad. That's why they are disappointed. You may disagree with me, sir. You know I love you. But the bottom line is, SOS speaks for the taxpayers. If we can't stop this process because of all of the caveats that could be in these contracts, then we can't. We will be the best board members, or I'm sure you guys will be too to represent and take care of these children once they're wherever. But remember, SOS wanted this. They want it stopped. They want everybody involved in it not to be a school board member anymore. They felt unheard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Ms. Shewitz? I can look at this two different ways, and as everyone should, there's the half full glass and there's the half empty glass. If we in the Wilkes-Barre Area School District had sports that did not have enough participants, there's no reason why those particular sports would have to be eliminated. They could be combined. Then you have the sports that are overgrown with, with people who may never get to participate, who may never even get a uniform. Now, the one thing I want to say about sports, I'm not a big fan of sports, but what sports does in the Wilkes-Barre Area School District is it makes people 
Make sure that the kids have the grades, because if you don't have the grades, you can't participate. So although everybody can say, well, we want to be, we want to be the best at football, we want to be this, we want to be that, the most important thing is getting the kids involved in sports to keep them off the streets, to keep them focused on academics that will keep them in programs that they want to do. David, 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 I want to jump in on the school board thing too for a second. Sure, real quick. Uh, and, and just commend Terry Shearwitz for her uh, mentioning it's about a pipe dream. It, it's not a pipe dream. So whatever happens, we can save Myers High School. It's extremely important. Dr. Shewitz has given me about a partially filled out application for the National Historic Register. I've promised to fill that out after the election. And we have just the most magnificent auditorium of any school ever, and that building needs to be saved. Thank you, okay. All right, for the city council candidates, this is going to Mr. Barrett. How would, and again, real quick, uh, 15 seconds if you could, how could you enforce the licensing and inspection of rental properties in the city to ensure safety and uh, generate proper revenue, which revenues that would be due? We have the strongest rental ordinances possible. Council has kept those up to speed. Uh, I, I think that we need, I think we have a lot of rental properties that are out there that we haven't even identified to this date. I know that there are rental properties out there. Uh, several members of council advocated not too long ago for some sort of stickers or something identifiable, identifying, similar to an inspection sticker you would have on your car, a small sticker on a window identifying it as a rental property. So that means it's a safe rental property. You can go there and just as importantly, if it's running under the radar as some rental properties are, that's not good either. That's not safe as well. So we want to make sure that all rental properties are accounted for. What do you think about a bulk garbage day? And that would be if people pay for disposals at least maybe once a month. Sure, I think we should do it quarterly. We had a successful program. We just did it once a year. We should do it quarterly. Okay, Mr. Barrett? Yes, I, I'm, I'm in favor of that as well. We realize it's an expense, but it's one way of keeping the trash from ending up in our streets and parks. All right, and uh, Mr. Schaefer, bulk of garbage day? Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right, we got to most of the questions. We are running out of time. Um, on behalf of the NAACP branch number 236, I'd like to thank you for attending. Um, I would like to recognize some people here from our branch, though, uh, from the uh, leadership team, the executive committee who came out today to help us set this thing up. Uh, you met our president, Ron Felton, of course, Flora Jenkins, secretary, uh, Larry Singleton, treasurer, uh, Reverend Brewster, Michael Brewster, and Peggy Felton and Rhonda Rabbit, they're here. How about just kind of standing up, guys, and giving them a hand? And before we leave, I would like all of the people in the audience to know this. The questions, we got to about 90% of them. Thank you for your patience. You have proved tonight that democracy and open debate and open thought are alive and well in Wilkes-Barre. And so give yourselves a hand. And to the service electric audience, it's going to be broadcast on Channel 2. Thank you for watching. My name is David Yonke, first vice president of the NAACP branch number 2306. Thanks for a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my